God bless you. you. May be seated. As we turn our attention towards the summer, we, uh, one of our next kind of events up is January, or excuse me, January, June 5th. And on June 5th, we'll have our graduation Sunday. So during the Sunday school hour, we will convene all the Sunday school together, children, uh, youth, and adult together, and we will meet in the multi-purpose room to celebrate our graduates. We will be celebrating our uh, elementary school graduates heading into middle school. We'll celebrate our uh, college and uh, associate's degree and military gra graduates as well. Uh, the, the the cherry on top of the of the of the Sunday, the 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 most important uh, graduation is that high school graduation, and we have a good group that uh, we're going to celebrate with, and so we look forward to that. and And if you are a teacher, and as you planned, uh, keep that uh, in mind. We will be meeting uh, during the Sunday school hour that. Sunday that evening, then, uh, we will have communion, so uh, keep that in mind as well. We're going to turn together to God's Word to James chapter 4, verses 11, to ver chapter 5, verse 6. As we look at James, we've been talking about the, the dangers of worldliness, and particularly employing worldly wisdom uh, as our chief instrument of how we do what we do. And the, 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 the motivation of worldly wisdom is self. How do I get what I want? And the, what it gives birth to is chaos, disorder, disunity, and every kind of evil practice. But also today, as we're going to look in the book of James, three interesting, almost unrelated challenges of sinful practices that we can fall into that all come out of a worldliness, but all produce an arrogance, all produce a sense of, uh, of pride in us that often we're blind to. And as we look at these three things, slandering others, godless planning, and the pursuit of wealth and luxuries, these are probably three things that we honestly somewhat excuse in ourselves, downplay in ourselves, and as well, kind of in our culture, don't really see them as centerpiece issues. These are things that are pretty normal in our given life, if we're honest with ourselves. And we kind of dismiss them as just kind of normal human behavior. But as we're going to look at it through the lens of Scripture, James is going to confront us with an appearance that in the face of a holy God, these things are rank arrogance. And they are offensive in the sight of God. And so today, we're just going to try to take a moment to let the Word of God challenge us, to speak to our hearts and, 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 and root out any, any, any issues so that we can just come before the Lord in sweet repentance to turn from those things and be right in the sight of our Lord. And so with that in mind, let's look together. James chapter 4, verses 11. We're going to go into chapter 5 to verse 6. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge a law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city Spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, well, do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. Such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the in innocent men who were not opposing you. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you. This is a challenging word because in a lot of ways, Father, we recognize that our brother James, inspired by you, is going to speak to issues that I think we'd all recognize are wrong, but we often fail to recognize as, as, as serious as they are by our proclivity, Lord, to, to quietly practice these things. Lord, I, I pray that we would receive a new vision of your heart on these matters, Lord, that no one would leave here today, Lord, with, a, with an additional burden around their neck, but quite the contrary. There is room at the cross to repent, to lay those things down that stand between us and you. Lord, by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, we are covered, we are forgiven, and the righteousness of Jesus is put on us. But Lord, we want to grow to be more like your Son. And so Lord, help us, Lord, show us today how we can honor you in every way. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. There's a growing trend in our country to invent weird little holidays. Have you ever heard like somebody go and say, come up to you and go, you know, it's taco day today? You never have anybody do that. You're like, there is, there's, if you get online and look up of all the weird little holidays people have invented, there's like bubble wrap appreciation day is one. If people are really nice to you on February 16th, it's be nice to a grouch day. Um, you know, you might, might worry about that. Just a lot of little absurd things. But there was a new holiday, not a new holiday, but actually a very old holiday that I read about in preparation for this, this sermon that actually goes back very far into the history of our nation. It's called Humiliation Day. Humiliation Day. Now, it doesn't mean we go around humiliating people. Actually, quite the contrary. It means we humble ourselves. It began, uh, at least the earliest thing that I read, was in 1775, uh, the leadership of the colonies sent out a proclamation calling the colonies to take a day to pray to fast, and to humble themselves before God, recognizing that as a people, if they were going to have any success, it would have to come in humility and, in, and with a repentant heart before God. And this practice continued, particularly among our earliest presidents. They would call for a day of humiliation uh, throughout uh, several different presidencies. But probably the most well-known one happened during the Civil War. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln called for a day of humiliation, a day for the nation to, pra to fast, to pray, and to repent and humble ourselves before God. And, and what he wrote in that proclamation is actually one of his more quoted um, uh, proclamations. You might recognize some of this. It says, and where is, when, whereas it is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with the assurance that the genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truths announced in Holy Scriptures and proven by all history, that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. Then he says this, and inasmuch as we know that by his divine law, nations like individuals are subjected to punishment and chastisement in this world, may not justly fear that awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, may be a punishment, but a, but may be, but a punishment inflicted upon us by our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in deceitfulness of our hearts that all of these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. That's a powerful statement. And I think as we think as a people, and, 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 and as we hear those words reverberate, how easy it is for us to fall into arrogance. And I think that's what 
what Abraham Lincoln is saying here. I mean, through the blessings God has so richly given, it's very easy to allow that to not be something that allows us to give him honor and humble us, but to kind of puff ourselves up. And I think one of the issues that we have in middle America is that arrogance seems like a very distant thing from us. Being proud isn't, I mean, we go out of our way to hold our hold doors for people to say we bought everything with a coupon. When there's a meal being served, we always make sure, like, we, we never rush to the front. And so we, 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 can, we maintain this veneer of humility in these kind of small and, and, and almost peculiar ways. Because arrogance and pride is for the elitist politician, for the snobby media person, for the strutting athlete and the vain, the vain celebrity. They're the proud. They're the arrogant, not us. What James is going to do is he's going to look at three topics that, if we're honest with ourselves, all of us struggle with. That in the sight of God, in light of who He is and what He does and what He's provided us, comes off as rank arrogance. And when we allow worldliness into our heart, when, when that desire for self begins to overtake a desire for the heart of God, which all of us can slip into, these things are not casual or small, but in the sight of God, arrogant. So let's start with our first one, slander. Slander. Let's take a look at, look at what James wrote. Here. He said, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Slander. Now, this phrase slander in the Scripture means to speak evil of someone. It's, it's character assassination. And I think in our very immature world, and particularly in a church that struggles with some of these uh, issues, there's a big difference between speaking truth and love and slander. The Bible talks many times about helping or confronting a brother or sister in sin and the role we have in that to restore and to speak truth and love. We live in a world today where anything that, that, that we're challenged on, we say we're being judged. Well, if sin is evident, that's not a judgment on a person's character. And we hate sin, but we love the sinner. And there's a big difference between speaking truth and love and slandering someone. And we know in our hearts the difference. I heard, I heard uh, an author say that if what we're about to say about someone isn't for their benefit, isn't for the kingdom, and isn't for the glory of God, we should probably not say it. There's a big difference between what we might say in dealing with speaking truth and love versus character assassination. Now, James handles this issue in a very interesting way. He says, anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. Now, what does he mean by that? He invokes the law. What does James mean when he says you're standing in judgment of the law or you're setting the law aside? What law is he talking about? Actually, James makes reference to the law in, in, this, in, his own, in this book. Turn with me very quickly, maybe just a page or two, to, to James chapter 2, verse 8. James references a law that applies to what we're talking about here, and particularly within the context of, of speaking ill against a brother or sister. It says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. And so the royal law that James is discussing here is love your neighbor as yourself. And we think about what is a royal law. It is something very precious to the king. It's something that's on the heart of the king. It's something the king speaks and shares often and demands of his court, demands of his people. Growing up in, my, in the household I grew up in with my mom and dad, if we had a royal law, let's say my, my dad in particular had a law that, that, over, that oversaw the house, it was respect. You do not disrespect him, and especially do not disrespect my mother. In fact, in my household that I grew up in, that was, that was maybe of the highest demand. I could get away with a lot of frivolous and dumb things that I did, even some ornery things that I did, but not disrespect. 
If I disrespected my mother, if I disrespected my sister or my father, it was an offense highly held in judgment in my home as a a child. What do you think God, His royal law is? It's love. There's nothing more important to God than love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Now imagine me as a child disrespecting my mother, what that would look like to my father. It would look like a child who thinks he's too good, not only for the law that has been laid down, for what he respects and demands, but it would, it would look like a child who thought he was better than his own family. And what James is saying here is when we violate that royal law of love your neighbor as yourself, specifically when we tear down, character assassinate, what he's saying there is not only do we not only in that moment are we acting as though we're above the law, we're acting arrogant in the face of the lawgiver. And there is one who judges the hearts of men. And there is one who lays down the law, and it's not us. And so as we think about what we say and what we say about one another, we swallow hard. When we slander, we are saying to God, we are above your royal law of love. And who among us can say we don't struggle with this? Who among us can say that our tongues have not gone in that direction? Who among us have not had to repent of this very issue? Yet we excuse it, right? It's a small thing. It's a quiet thing. But it's not to God. The next issue that we face is an interesting one. It's the boasting about tomorrow. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money, while you do not even know what will happen tomorrow, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. As such, all such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows what he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Now, have you ever heard a Bible-believing Christian, somebody you respect uh, in, in, in the Lord, say something like this? Well, we'll see on Sunday, Lord willing, right? And, we, and I think within kind of our circles, that's a very common thing to say. Why would someone say something like that? There's a recognition, even in those kind of, even in those kind of subtle and small things, that, listen, God is sovereign. And I may say I'm going to do something, But what he has in mind, that's what's going to happen. It's a very quiet and subtle way of saying, I'm not the master of my own fate. My God is. I mean, how many of us maybe had plans over the last three years? How's that gone, right? And it's a recognition of God's sovereignty. But furthermore than that, it's a recognition that my God has the right to interrupt my plans. Furthermore, it's an admission that in those moments of my life where I'm seeking to lay out what I'm going to do, I must trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding and all my ways acknowledge Him, and He will make my path straight. A recognition that although planning is not sinful, godless planning that removes him from the process, that doesn't recognize his authority, doesn't recognize his right to not only interrupt our plans, but also recognizes God's right to dictate his will in our lives, is critical. James is not attacking planning, but planning that leaves out God. James gives a picture of a businessman who disregards the will of God or his sovereignty. Such a man lives as a practical atheist who is proud of his his self-determination apart from God. What What rank arrogance to disregard the plans of God for the meanderings of man. There's a picture of a businessman in, in this passage who makes all these plans and makes all these boasts about what they're going to do and where they're going to spend time. 
in a godless fashion. I use the phrase there, practical atheism. And imagine a person who, who, who believes in the Lord, who talks about the Lord, who is involved in all kinds of spiritual disciplines and is a part of the body of believers. But as they live their daily life, as they make their plans and as they do what they do, gives very little, gives very little thought, gives very little time to seeking God's will, gives very little thought to what God may have in mind. And I'm sure all of us struggle with the idea that God has the right to interrupt our plans. And as I look at this passage, you know, it, it's, it, it's, just, it's a simple acknowledgement that we are not the chief agents of our lives. God is. Turn with me to John chapter 5. This is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. John chapter 5. Jesus is trying to answer the question as to how He knows how to do what He does. And in verse 17, He says something very powerful. He says, Jesus said to them, My Father is always at His work to this very day, and I too am working. And then He goes on in verse 19 and He says, Jesus gave them this answer, I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by Himself. He can only do what He sees His Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all He does. Yes, to your amazement, He will show you even greater things than these. There's a picture of, 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 of a God in verse 17 who's always at work. As we read this book, the Word of God, man is not the chief agent of history. Man is not carving out his path. As we read this Scripture from the beginning, it is God who is working His will through history. It is God who comes to Noah with the plan and invites Noah to join Him. It is God who comes to Abraham with His plan to create His own people. Will Abraham trust Him? It is God who comes to Moses and says, I'm going to save my people. Will you be my prophet. He comes to David. And God chooses him, not the other way around. And calls David to walk with him. Jesus meets Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and He says, follow me. The picture of Scripture is that we have a God that's active and at work in our world. Not a God who's just waiting for us to act and hope that He can come behind us and bless our activity. But a God who is active in our world and inviting us to join Him. And as we look at godless planning, imagine an individual who denies the working of God in their life to pursue their own human meanderings. Listen, we do got a plan. Hey, we do got to do the things that we do. This is not a, 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 an attempt for us to be weirdly superstitious and be like, honey, I'm going to go get a drink of water out of the kitchen, Lord willing. Like we don't have to, like this is not, a, this is not an invitation to get weirdly superstitious that everything I say, I got to say, Lord, Lord willing, you know, hand out these papers for the Sunday school class, Lord willing, you know, we, we don't have to live that way, but we do need to have a humble recognition of God's sovereignty and will in our lives. And to live and to make plans apart from God. You know, imagine uh, creating a five-year plan as a church without seeking God's face. It would be a five-year plan of sin, wouldn't it? All planning has to be tender-hearted to the will and working of God. Understanding that He is sovereign and what I say may or may not happen. That He is sovereign and that He has the right to interrupt my plans. That He is sovereign and He is at work. And it's more incumbent upon me for me to adjust my life to Him than to pray He adjusts His blessings to my plans. And in the face of such an amazing God, what arrogance would it be to live otherwise? Then finally, arrogance of living for wealth and its pleasures. Let's read that passage again, verses five and chapter five, verses one to six. 
Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have, for, you have hoarded wealth in the days in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay, the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. <clears throat> There's a picture of, of wealth. Now, James, again, I've said this before in our study, James. James is not against wealth or those who are wealthy. But when we live by the most base aspect of worldliness, that pursuit of wealth for its safety, that life that lives to fulfill its own indulgence and its own luxury, that is what James is speaking against. You know, God may richly bless us and have wonderful purposes in that to provide for us Throughout Pennsylvania history, Pennsylvania is the home of religious dissidents. William Penn set it up for that purpose. Actually went through Europe and advertised people who were not accepted for the religious faith where they lived could come to Pennsylvania. It's just like Europe. And these are all the things you can grow in the beautiful mountains of Pennsylvania. And many people from Europe came to this country, or particularly this state, as religious dissidents. Two of the more prominent in our in our in our state's history, are the Quakers and the Amish, both of who doctrinally shun wealth, but have been given more than what they know to do with by Almighty God. It's interesting. Sometimes God blesses. Sometimes God blesses. And in fact, everywhere where the gospel has gone forth, as Abraham Lincoln talked about, blessings of the gospel follow in some very real ways. Nations that have turned to the Lord often prosper. But living for those luxuries and living for those pleasures and living for the safety and the prestige that those things provide is sin. I, I, I like how this passage talks about that the, the, your gold and silver are corroded their corrosion will testify against you and eat, eat your flesh like fire. I don't like that last part, but it, it's talking about, the, in a sense, the hoarding. That's what, that's what causes the, the, the metals to corrode, is they're just sitting there. You know, oftentimes we, we hoard out of a sense of safety or a sense of pride. Sometimes we seek luxuries and pleasures. Now, what is James trying to say here? There's, there's a sense. When I was a kid, I always hated Sunday nights because I get the Sunday night blues because Monday was coming and I had to go back to school. Now, Monday's my day off, and so I actually really like Mondays. I'm like the only person like, yeah, it's Monday, you know. But what's interesting is my parents or my grandparents, if I was at their house, would often watch 60 Minutes. And I hated that tick, 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 tick. Because it wasn't like that the show was coming to an end. It was like the weekend was coming to an end. Tick, tick, tick. I hated it. It was like it just reminded me, you know, time's running out on the weekend. I have all this school I didn't work, I didn't do, and tomorrow's coming. Tick, 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 tick. Well, you know, there, there ought to be a certain tick, 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 tick that we're feeling in the age in which we live. Tick, tick, tick. We can't live like it's the weekend, can we? And I think as we look at this Scripture, it's challenging this notion that people would live for, for self-indulgence and luxury when the clock is ticking. This passage, there's an urgency in it. That judgment is coming. That time will one day be rolled up. And what God has given us in this time is for its sweet purposes to use to provide for our needs, but as well to use as He gives us opportunity for the building of His kingdom, our time, talent, and tithe. And for us to, to use those things on our self-indulgence in the face of a God who we will one day meet. And as unbelievers will judge us for sin and for us as believers judge our works 
for their value, it is rank arrogance to live our lives pursuing the most worldly of pursuits. Wealth and its indulgence. God often blesses His people. And that's not what James is speaking against. As Americans, we struggle with this because historically, we are by far the most wealthy people that have ever lived, particularly among the middle class. But it takes a lot to live as an American, and some of us are saying, yeah, Pastor Matt, but, I, but we have to scrape by to get, our, to get our bills paid. It is a weird kind of dynamic that we live in as Americans. We can be both powerfully wealthy by, by history standard, yet be, be struggling. And this isn't to put anyone down. It's simply to confront a heart that may live for luxury instead of living for the kingdom of God. Now, we put all these things together and we say the arrogance of slander. And I think all of us would say we struggle with this. We look at the arrogance of godless planning, how easy it is just kind of live our lives as workaday lies and fail to acknowledge God's sovereignty in the day-to-day life in which we live. The arrogance of pursuing the pleasures of this world, all of us struggle with that. And so I think what James is asking of us today is he's calling for a proclamation of a day of humiliation. A day to just humble ourselves before God and, and pray. If there's any area of our heart that we have made probably very unknowingly been arrogant before Him to just humbly repent, to lay that, to lay that sin aside at the foot of the cross and move forward unburdened, unburdened by that sin, but to do the work of repentance. And as I've shared this word, I know God has been speaking to my heart about things I need to lay before Him. And as we just take this moment to humble ourselves and repent before God, I just pray, I'm just going to give you 30 seconds here at the the conclusion of this message to to just do the same. Whatever's on your heart, let's just humble ourselves now and just lay it before Him. Lay it at the cross, repent and turn from those things. Let's just confess whatever things that might be on our heart this morning before God. Let's do that in the quiet now. Lord, there's a, there's a grief in repentance. An acknowledgement before You that I'm a sinner and, and Lord, this is how I've offended You. And Lord, we, we come to You in that sorrow. But there's also joy and peace found at the cross. A realization that if we repent of our sins, Confess our sins. You're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And Lord, we just ask that, Lord, You would do that now. As as Your people have come to You in sincere repentance, by the power of Your Spirit, Lord, may we rise up turned from those things. Lord, if we recognize that we're careless with our tongue and how we speak of others, Lord, we, to a man, to a woman, Lord, today we repent. Lord, if we recognize that there are areas of our lives or just even as we live our lives, we kind of just live of our own devices and don't acknowledge Your will or seek Your face in what we do, Lord, please we ask that You'd forgive us. Lord, if we're honest with ourselves, we may not be a rich person by by American standards, but we recognize that we do live our lives for its creature comforts. Lord, forgive us for that. Or seeking to find our safety or our pursuit or our value in, in wealth 
Lord, we ask you to forgive us for that, Lord, for that's a temptation that for all of us is right at our door, Lord. We, we are pounded with a message from our culture that we are not satisfied unless we have the next thing. And Lord, I pray you'd forgive us for that, Lord, because we would never, I know I know this, this body, I know the heart and sincerity of this people. None of us would want to be seen arrogant in your sight. We want to be those humble people who bow to no man, but who bow to God. And who submit our hearts totally to you and willingly submit to your word. Help us, Lord to be that people who love you first and best above all others and above all the desires of our hearts. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we close today, as we come out of a moment of repentance, 